Okay. Eh, muy buenos días a todos y todas. Voy por inaugurar la audiencia número 5 del ciclo ordinario de sesiones de la que llega por título Reparación con perspectiva de género. Voy a pedir, por favor, que apaguen sus micrófonos. Eh, Juan José, por favor, te encargo eso. Gracias. Decía que es la audiencia número 5 que lleva por título Reparación con perspectiva de género. Y estamos en la audiencia número 5, que es entitled Reparación con una perspectiva de género y diversidad en transicional justicia. My name is Ulisa Mantilla. I'm the president of the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights for the Rights of Women and uh, for Truth, Memory and Justice. And Commissioners Roberta Clark and Joel Hernandez are with me today. Also, Maria Claudia Pulido, Assistant Executive Secretary of the Inter-American Commission is here. I would like to greet civil society organizations and the representatives of the state of Argentina who are here today. Um, regarding time allocation, civil society organizations will have 35 minutes. Then the Inter-American Commission will have 25 minutes. We will have some space for comments by the organizations for 28 minutes, and then the commission will be wrapping up the hearing. Please mind the clock on the screen to respond time, and please mute yourselves when you are not taking the floor. So we will give the floor to civil society organizations now. You have 35 minutes. Good morning. My name is Cristiana, um, um, Cristiana Rosero. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm here on representation of Centro Reproductivo. We are a global organization who works for the protection of reproductive rights of all persons, including those affected by armed conflicts around the world. In our effort, we supported organizations of transitional justice in Colombia so that they can incorporate a gender perspective in their work. The Colombian armed conflict has a, had a disproportionate effect on women and children who had suffered different violences based on gender, including reproductive violence that affect their autonomy, and it includes um, contraception, abortion, and forced pregnancies and violence. Also, um, there are no adequate reparations for the needs of the victims in spite of the impacts that I have just mentioned. Taking into consideration our experience in Colombia, we have some recommendations regarding how reparations with a gender perspective should be addressed when it comes to reproductive violence. First, the investigation and recognition of the occurrence of reproductive violence. That's the first step to guarantee the reparation of the victims and survivors. And it should consider how a context of gender violence has an influence that is, disprop and that is disproportionate. Also, there should be measures that are individual, for example, including the loss of the reproductive capacity, infertility, and the economic and human costs of forced pregnancies that affect victims, their families, and their communities. Also, the victims have access, should have access to reparation, restitution, rehabilitation, non-repetition measures, and measures to guarantee their psychological and physical recovery. These measures should contemplate a specialized support to address the emotional and physical consequences of violence. Also, the reparation measures should consider the ethnical aspects of the victims to avoid racial violence. Also, we consider that it's important that reparation processes include participatory mechanisms to focus on the voices of the victims. Reparation measures should take into consideration the ethnicity of the victims and that their ideas should be included in the reparation plans through participatory mechanisms. By including reparation measures, uh, in the case of indigenous peoples and communities, there should be measures that avoid discrimination and gender discrimination and reproductive violence, taking into consideration the traditions of indigenous communities. Also, we consider that it's important to consider the public recognition of the perpetrators of the violence. These, um, usually the perpetrators do not admit the violences that they 
commit. And therefore, we should consider measures such as consultation, including the victims. And also the victims should be able to participate in the proceedings involving the perpetrators. Also, there should be access to education, information, and reproductive and sex uh, and reproductive health services for the victims. Sometimes in isolated communities, there is no access to these services. Finally, it, affirmative measures should be considered in order to transform gender stereotypes that perpetrate discrimination and violence against women, girls, and LGBTI persons. And for that, there should be a distribution of materials that address the stereotypes and the prejudices that prevent sexual and reproductive health with the differentiated approach for girls and adolescents. Also, it's important to mention that the Commission of Truth in Colombia take very important steps by recognizing the effects of reproductive violence, especially in rural areas. And also they have participated in the compliance of sentence that it has to do with access to free and safe abortion. Also, it's important to uh, recall that the commission has called up on the state of Colombia to comply with the sentences. And also the different uh, organizations of the state should comply with the different measures and recommendations regarding the victims of the armed conflict. Thank you so much. Thank you, Madam President. Now, Karina Fernandez uh, from Chile will be presenting together with my colleague, Magdalena Cis. Magdalena, are you here? Thank you. Mm, hello, my name is Magdalena Garces. I'm a lawyer and with Karina Fernandez, we are human rights defenders in Chile. We would like to say that regarding political sexual violence in the transitional justice context in Chile, um, it's important to mention that with the termination of the dictator dictatorship in Chile, the transitional justice mechanisms implemented by the authorities um, did not include a differentiated treatment and did not include any gender perspective in terms of reparation. And therefore, um, it's important that to understand that sexual violence was an important part of the dictatorship in Chile. And it's important to understand that human rights organizations started to identify these practices when they provided psychological support for the victims. It's important to highlight the medical program of one organization of civil society. They started to work with the victims and they start to classify and systematize the information when they started to work with the victims. Also, it's important to mention that women's organizations played a very important role when it comes to the recovery of democracy. For example, the movement Mujeres por la Vida, they have the motto that had to do with promoting women reparation, especially for the families and the victims of the dictatorship of repression. Um, after the dictatorship, no mechanisms were, were created to take into consideration the gender perspective and the sexual violence committed during the dictatorship. And it's important to understand that the commission on to address torture, for example, did not take into consideration sexual violence, although some organizations mentioned these practices. In 2004, um, there, there were some reports that include this sexual violence, but there are several reports that indicate that sexual violence was not investigated and there are only the testimonies of women who decided to share their experience. There were many uh, women, for example, over 316 women asserted that they were violated during the dictatorship. 
or that they suffer some kind of political violence. Also, in terms of the judiciary, there has been no differentiated approach, but we need to highlight that there are two situations in which sexual violence was included as part of the torture, is classified as torture, but there is no distinction or no definition of this phenomenon, and there are no judicial consequences after asserting the existence of sexual violence in the dictatorship. Thank you. Regarding Chile, we would like to say that the transitional justice has been a struggle uh, and an effort made by the victim is the result of their efforts. It's important to understand that sexual violence is an important aspect in the trial and we are preparing a strategy so that sexual violence is made visible because it's an element that has not been punished so far and is not included in jurisprudence and therefore the testimonies and experiences of several women who have suffered sexual violence during the dictation dictatorship should be included in the jurisprudence. Also, this is not only for civil reparation, because uh, in terms of the civil proceedings, we see that in recent years, there have been some litigations in order to include sexual violence in the judgments and decisions. And we have found that in the courts right now, they have a more or a wider perspective and they include sexual violence in their proceedings. And they follow the recommendations in uh, international instruments such as the Convention of Belén do Pora. Um, I would like to say that after the sentence of 2002, what we see is that at the civil instance or jurisdiction, we have started to see some changes. And we see that the appeal court of Santiago issued this decision taking into consideration sexual violence and together with the jurisprudence of the different inter-American system organizations, we have been able to see that th there are reparations now that are less painful for the victims. We revendicate rights as well, and we are reestablishing rights through these proceedings after 2002. But we are still facing a challenge. I need to mention that I would like to mention the passing of Elizabeth and I know that this is very painful for the commission and for the inter-American human rights system. Honorable Commission of Human Rights. My name is Flor de Maria Mesa. I'm from the Universidad de la República and together from Elena Rocha from Sejil, we are supporting a group of 28 women who are former political prisoners that are requesting preparation for the different types of torture that they suffered during the um, dictatorship. We will listen to one of these women, Antonia Janes. And we are talking about the dictatorship between 1968 and 1985. Uh, at the time, these women were defenders in different unions and they were detained in different centers across the country. 35 years later, we see that progress is slow and there are no many reparations. Some years ago, the commission listened to these women because there was a lack of access to justice and reparation for women who have suffered torture and sexual violence during the dictatorship. And they have not received many assistance in terms of reparation. And we see that many of the perpetrators were later condemned by other crimes, but not for the crimes of torture or sexual violence, which are not considered crimes against humanity. And therefore the victims are still waiting for justice and comprehensive reparation. Some of the women have already died 
um, what we are seeing that sexual violence is a strategy of the state to attack women, political prisoners, just because they were women. We are concerned because there are several bills that imply several uh, types of regressiveness as well. With regard to the obligation of the state regarding the women who suffered violence during the dictatorship, in July 2016, the CEDU recommended the state of Uruguay to adopt measures of reparation and symbolic reparations for women who suffered sexual violence during the dictatorship. Therefore, we would like for the commission to send a note to the state of Uruguay informing of the Inter-American standards that should inform the investigation and the reparation of these cases. Now I would like to give the floor to Antonia Janes. Good morning. How can I express what reparation means when next year, 15 years will have elapsed from the coup in our country? We need reparation and justice. There are several barriers in justice. There is no control of conventionality. There is no prompt investigation. The fact that these are crimes against humanity is not considered. And society needs to understand that these crimes should be sanctioned and that violence against women is not tolerated. We want reparation and the truth the victims and their families and those who live in Uruguay have the right to know the truth of what happened in a public way, taking into consideration the specific conditions and circumstances. These stories are in the shadows and the silence. The state and the judiciary are not talking about this. We need the state to apologize. It should give a message to society by recognizing that they have violated our rights. And this should be a public knowledge because this is a part of our right to reparation and the guarantees of non-repetition. We need programs of education for little children in order to eradicate any type of gender violence. We need reparation in terms of health, the systematic repetition of repressive processes to which we were subjected show that violence against women was a torture instrument against us that left us with difficult emotional effects and psychological effects. We see that since 2019, we stopped receiving psychological and emotional support, as well as our families. According to the national law, health is fundamental, is a human right, and is indivisible from other rights. Therefore, we demand the state of Uruguay to comply with its obligations. We are and we were social defenders. They tried to break us, but they couldn't. We continue working to build a country within an institutional framework that gives our daughters, sons, grandchildren measures of non-repetition of violence. Just because we are women for being activists, we want these measures for everyone who inhabits in Uruguay. Thank you so much. Good morning. My name is Leonora Arteaga, and I work in Foundation for Due Process of Law. And together with me are my, I have my colleague Sonia Rubia is with me today. I'd like to talk about three points or aspects that we consider fundamental um, before asking ourselves if it's possible to repair with a gender perspective. In the first place, violence and particularly sexual violence is not only about sexual abuse. There are different forms of sexual violence because we need to consider not only women, but also men 
we are talking about forced steril sterilization, sexual exploitation, I mean, other forms of violence against women and men. Therefore, we need to take into consideration all these forms or violence or different behaviors that could lead to sexual violence or gender-based violence. When we talk about gender violence, it's not about actions against women alone. We are seeing that the gender perspective should also include men, boys, girls, LGBTI persons. And therefore, we need to consider different groups in this gender perspective. Thirdly, we need to understand that there are victims of sexual violence that according to literature could be considered victims of a complex nature. For example, a person who has been a perpetrator could also be a victim of sexual violence. This happened in the case of El Salvador or in the case of Colombia, to give you some examples. In general terms, victims of violence and especially victims of sexual violence face different forms of stigmatization and re-victimization uh, that go beyond the original fact. And this stigmatization comes from society, from the community, and even from their own families. Because gender violence and sexual violence doesn't happen, does not occur in isolation. It's part of a structure of domination and subordination that allows for it to happen and validates it. We need to understand that perpetrators are not only the persons who committed the act of violence, but we need to understand that there could be other perpetrators, societies, judges, prosecutors that do not care or do not address these cases as they should. And this creates a stigmatization against the victim and this leads to social stigmatization. Therefore, we need to take into consideration that when states provide reparation through administrative programs or decisions, criminal decisions or administrative or civil judgments, etc. States should be very clear about this. Recognition is the most important thing, it's crucial because this provides legitimacy to reparation. Recognizing the responsibility for what happened, the need for a punishment against the perpetrator to send a message that this should not happen again and to attribute the responsibility where it should be and not to create a load on the victims. Our organization has been working in recent years so that reparation against victims of sexual violence are not only parts of the administrative programs of reparation, but also we want to have more prosecutors, judges, and judicial operators that take into consideration these standards when they decide on their cases. We believe that administrative programs and judicial reparations are two supplementary ways that provide more alternatives and better alternatives for the victims. We've seen that more and more courts are interested in including the gender perspectives in their decisions, but also there are many judges which have ignored this perspective in their analysis and in their judgments. And they have not analyzed all these aspects. And as a result, only a few Latin American courts have focused on this matter. Most of these courts have focused on the 
punitive component when resolving cases of violations of human rights. I would like to conclude by indicating that some decisions in Latin America that are worth mentioning at this hearing. We are convinced that it's necessary to create more spaces of exchange between judges and prosecutors with the support of the commission. I would like to talk about a specific case in Guatemala. Guatemala had an armed conflict in recent years, and there were at least 22 judgments regarding serious human rights violations as part of the armed conflict in that country. And there are four judgments in which the judges established reparation measures. And in three of these cases, there is a gender perspective, such as um, the case Molina Tyson, and the other case is the case of the Embassy of Spain. In addition, in Guatemala, there is a provision in the criminal procedural law that is a dignified hearing. And this means that not is only about the judges, but also the laws have been updated so that judges are able to resolve reparations. Uh, we are also working a lot in El Salvador. In El Salvador, there is a reparation program that so far has not incorporated a gender perspective, but we hope that in the case of the armed conflict of that country, especially with regard to the Mosote massacre, we hope to have reparations when there is a decision regarding the responsibility of those that are being judged in that case. Thank you so much. Good morning. I am Christian Paula Fundación Pacta. I am with Mirta Muragas of Synergia and Karen Anaya. We are members of the LGBTI Litigators Network of the Americas. In the case of South America, the national security doctrine was positioned through the Condor Plan, a continental strategy embraced mainly by military dictatorships for repression through illegal methods against the population by means of forced disappearance, torture, extrajudicial execution, crimes against humanity, again, among others. This way of conceiving the other is complemented by the conservative traditionalist imposition of the US government under Reagan's administration. In that sense, homosexuality was considered a crime in the countries where Planned Condor was applied, which led to the LGBTI population uh, being labeled as subversive, applying cruel forms of violence under the idea of moral reorganization. Despite of this, there are few truth reports that provide evidence of violence, in particular the reports of Paraguay 2008, Ecuador 2010, Colombia 2022. In Ecuador, the report of the Truth Commission, without truth, there is no justice, showed that state violence against LGBTI population titled homophobia and transphobia, violence and discrimination against the LGBTI community in the 90s and 2000s. The commission was not able to obtain direct testimonies from LGBTI persons. As of the time of the investigation, 10 years had passed since the discrimination of homosexuality and distrust in the state persisted. 20 years after the criminalization, victims decided to speak and give their testimonies. In 2013, Ecuador published the Victims' Reparation Law, in which it recognized the objective responsibility for the content of the truth report, establishing an administrative reparation mechanism. Despite of this, the law does not recognize collective victims as beneficiaries. In 2015, LGBTI organizations requested the ombudsman's office the recognition and reparation as a collective victim according to the content of the truth report. This request has not been processed so far or answered by the state. In 2019, collectives such as Cochinelli, Años Dorado, and victims of 516 sued the state for crimes against humanity, process that is not progressing. 
Ecuador, based on reparation law, should have built a museum of memory which does not exist with a space for LGBTI victims. I will give the floor to Mirta. Thank you. In the case of Paraguay, the dictatorship of Stroessner was one of the longest and bloodiest in Amer Latin America. Not only the political position was the la target of repression, but all possible behaviors outside the norm. The murder of Bernardo Aranda in 1959 and Luis Palmieri in 1982 gave rise to two great persecutions of people because of the sexual orientation documented in the final report of the Truth and Justice Commission. In the context of the Aranda case on September 1959, a newspaper, El Pais, a newsletter was published, the letter of an amoral, vindicating human rights of LGBTI people, and it's considered the first public manifestation in favor of LGBTI rights in the country. In 2003, the parliament created a Truth and Justice Commission to investigate human rights violations during the dictatorship. It presented final report in 2008 regarding LGBTI persons. The report acknowledged the lack of statistical records reliable of repression against LGBTI victims. He conducted two case studies on persecution in the context of Aranda and Palmieri. Three final recommendations included human rights violations against LGBTI persons. The commission recommended the states that victims of sexual violence, especially women and girls, as well as other persons of different sexual orientations, be offered apologies for serious violations committed against them. Secondly, to uh, maintain programs for the promotion and protection of human rights for groups, in particular, a situation of vulnerability and risk, such as persons with other sexual identities, and recommended uh, among legal reforms to include a gender perspective incorporating the rights of women and other sexual identities. The Paraguayan state has not complied with these recommendations. At the presentation of the final report in 2008, President Lugo, on behalf of the Paraguayan state, publicly apologized to the victims, but made no reference to LGBTI victims. That is to say, to say they were absent and remain invisible. Thank you. Thank you to everyone. My delegation, Laura Peveda, Somos Identidad, and also Fundación Arcoiris. I will give the floor to my colleague, Catherine. Thank you. Good morning. I would like to thank you for inviting us to this hearing. Based on the situation of Afro LGBTI victims in Colombia, we would like to highlight the importance of inclusion of an intersectional. Uh, approach in transitional justice. Firstly, the historical lack of this intersectional approach in public policies and justice transitional processes, the lack of visibility of Afro-LGBTI population has hindered the access to uh, the rights to the population in Latin America, perpetrating uh, impunity regarding the human rights violations. In the case of Colombia, although there is a guideline for the inclusion of a differential approach for the collection of statistical data, there are no specific monitoring um, programs to comply with the guideline. That hinders the development of intersectional policies in administration of uh, justice, the guarantee of uh, economic, social, cultural, environmental rights. The incorporation with a sexual approach will allow the identification of the complexity for the subjects that are part of social groups that have been historically been excluded to access resources, opportunities, and social mobility. Secondly, the need to develop a comprehensive reparation policies for the victims, states should not only characterize the plurality of the population, but they should understand how the way in which these priorities are developed, interact, so that they can determine those identities, avoiding Afro and LGBTI persons um, being treated as, uh, to be treated as such when uh, policies are being developed. The organizations present here today 
there has been a report presented before the uh, court in Colombia uh, explaining the particular social and uh, cultural context Afro and LGBTI population uh, go through in Colombia. We believe it is necessary to overcome the differentiated approach for the comprehensive reparation of the victims. This approach does not enable um, people to be differentiated according to the different contexts in which they suffer, but it establishes a fixed identity, being gay, being trans, being lesbian, being Afro, limiting the efficiency of the policies for the victim. And carrying two consequences. Firstly, the reduction to the category of victim, denying multiple identities, which could lead to the belief that all victims are the same. Secondly, the condition of victim eliminates the possibility for this to be understood in its context. Lastly, we believe there are great challenges to move forward to a comprehensive reparation of victims of armed conflicts with an intersectional approach. Taking into account the experience of the peace accord, the Colombian case showed us that in order to achieve justice and long lasting peace, we need a commitment of the state for the recognition of different identities. Taking into account what has been said, we request the Honorable Commission to urge states to have the duty to recognize repair victims of armed conflicts, take into account uh, ethnicity, sexual orientation, gender orientation, and other discrimination factors, promote and provide technical assistance to the state, uh, focusing on Colombian state and ju special jurisdiction on peace to strengthen the transitional justice processes developing the participation of the victims to provide technical assistance and strengthen the monitoring system so that the states in particular the colombian state can comply with the duties of comprehensive reparation related to the uh, territories that should be um, recovered peacefully also for the recognition of the violations of human rights where populations have been violated in order to promote the recognition of the impact of the armed conflicts for Afro-LGBTI victims. Thank you. Thank you. The participation on this first stage is concluded. We will now begin the participation of the Inter-American Commission I would like to greet and ask the second vice president, Margaret May Macaulay, whether she has any questions or comments. Um, Madam President, I, I really don't because I'm, I, firstly, I must apologize for being so late to enter. I had to rush down to my office because my internet um, service at the house was not working. And then I couldn't get in <laughs> and, uh, until eventually I've gotten in. And because of that circumstance, I would rather give the time I would use to others to um, ask questions so I can listen and, and be fully au fait with what has been said this morning. So I do apologize to all of you. I was really looking forward to participating fully in this. Thank you so much. Muchas gracias, segunda vicepresidenta. Entendemos perfectamente. Es parte de la virtuality. Thank you, Madam Second Vice President. That is part of virtuality that occurs more often than we would like it. Uh, Commissioner Hernandez, do you have any questions or comments? Thank you, Madam President. I would like to congratulate all the participating organizations for having requested such an important hearing. And I would like to make some comments about certain aspects. I believe that participating organizations have offered a complete scenario regarding 
reparation with a gender and sexual diversity perspective in the process of uh, transitional justice. They have offered valuable uh, elements so that we can understand how to foster comprehensive reparation with a gender perspective. Several of the countries that have been mentioned, uh, I am their rapporteur, such as Colombia, but I am also the rapporteur for Bolivia and Chile. And when they have mentioned these countries, transitional justice processes have been mentioned, and there are victims, women, who have suffered sexual violence, torture, and other crimes committed within the complex context of dictatorships and armed conflicts that existed in these and other countries. I would like to start by pointing out the obvious. For the Inter-American Commission, it is fundamental to monitor the process under ongoing transitional justice processes, but we consider it to be very important to highlight any situation in which we observe reproductive violence. It is also very important to us to highlight the importance that this monitoring process should have an intersectional approach because sometimes these intersectionalities are multiple. They do not only affect women victims of sexual violence, but sometimes there are other conditions of vulnerability that make these reparation processes even more complex. One of the main things the Commission has to do is to pay attention to this development. At the same time, the Commission has issued thematic reports on the subject. I recall one 2006 women before uh, violence uh, as a result of armed conflict in Colombia and violence against uh, gay, lesbian, trans, intersex persons in Latin America. Uh, published in 2015. We have closely monitored the cases um, within uh, Colombia. We celebrated the macro case that was open in terms of gender violence. We believe that is going to be a fundamental space in order to uh, make progress regarding reparation for women victims of the armed conflict in Colombia. But we shouldn't be limited to this monitoring level or establishing inter-American standards as strengthening comprehensive reparation. It is also very important to move forward in order to strengthen internal domestic structures. And there's something that called my attention. Arteaga's uh, participation mentioned something key that has to do with the training of justice operators. If we really want to make forward and achieve reparation processes, we need to work hand in hand with national authorities, starting with justice operators, because if prosecutor's office include a gender perspective, but also judges are able to carry out processes with a gender perspective with the control of conventionality and the application of inter-American standards, we are going to be able to be able to provide comprehensive reparation. We need to work with states in the strengthening of their national legislation. They have provided very important elements so that we can provide technical assistance to the states in the development of their norms and regulations. We That's what I wanted to highlight. 
I want to say that the different perspectives have provided me a lot of elements to better understand justice with a gender perspective. I will now give the floor to Commissioner Roberta Clark. Thank you very much, um, Commissioner Mantia, and good morning to everyone. Really so wonderful to uh, be with you all in the space, even though to speak about these um, rather uh, these harsh violations of human rights. But first, I just want to thank you for all of the information and also the way that it has been expressed. And I take away quite a lot from this session. And I think my the, I, the, the first thing I take away, um, and I certainly we agree with you vigorously, is that we do need differentiated justice and a justice that responds to the understanding of the diversity and plurality of our populations, and in particular, um, the plurality of populations who have been historically discriminated against and marginalized, and at all of the intersections that that marginalization happens. Um, I also sort of take away from you all the clear message that differentiated, differentiated justice starts with ending silence and ending invisibility. And I, and I hear you saying that the silence and the invisibility are around two main axes. The first one, the invisibility of issues, so the invisibility of the harm experienced by marginalized populations based on, 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 on gender and sex and sexual orientation. So the, the invisibility of, of sexual violence as a harm suffered in the context of armed conflict, which then means that you don't have, it's not part of the justice continuum. Um, the invisibility or silence around reproductive violence, which also means that there are there are no mechanisms and no remedies, and also no punishment for those who have perpetrated that form of harm. So there are sort of issues around which there's silence, and there are also populations around which there is silence. And as I said, those populations, and as you've said over and over, um, are populations of persons experiencing compounded discrimination. And you spoke about Afro descendants and um, Commissioner McCauley, I know you have a lot to say about that, and, and I hope that you come back around to make a comment on that. Um, uh, indigenous peoples, um, of course, LGBTI persons, of, I'm the rapporteur for the rights of LGBTI persons, um, um, women and girls who experience so many forms of sex, sex based and, and harm. Um, in, in society, generally far less for in context of armed conflict, where impunity really is the um, is the is the fact of those situations. So I hear you also calling for um urging the commission to continue its work because as uh, Commissioner Hernandez has said, that a lot of this work is also ongoing. But perhaps we have to amplify our work, amplify the monitoring. And I, I hear the request that you're asking for urging states to recognize the diversity of victims in armed conflict and to incorporate that recognition in laws, in the, in the law and also in the, um, in, the, in the justice chain. So that would include, of course, training, which uh, Commissioner Hernandez has also spoken about. It also includes some law reform um, and also training of just officers such as prosecutors and police to do the, 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 the due diligence investigation, and investigation particularly when the, the, the occurrence has happened uh, a little while in the past, so that I think requires some different kinds of skills to excavate the stories and to create the space for victims to speak their truth. One of the things that someone said, and I can't, I don't, I want to say who it was, but it was around the question of perpetration. Maybe it was Leonore who said it. She says perpetration is not just the perpetrators are not just those who do the act, but perpetrators are all those who look away from 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 the act and deny. A justice, and I think that that is true. In a sense, when you say perpetration is more systemic, what we're talking about is impunity and the failure of the state to hold state actors accountable, not only for their actions, but also for the actions of non-state perpetrators. And I think that that's something we really have to think. Language is so important, and we talk about impunity a lot, but this is another kind of perpetration, right? The indirect perpetration, when you look away from harm being caused and and um, and I, I think that maybe I want to think a little bit more about that kind of language in, um, because it's important for the advocacy, how we, the, the words that we use. So I want to just say, I, I agree with all of the recommendations which have been made. 
there's this one question I want to ask, and I um, uh, let me just see who who said it. Maybe it was you, Christian, when you talked about collective reparations, and I wanted to ask you and anyone who wants to answer that: what would collective reparations look like? I, I, I also understand, of course, the, the recommendations around addressing stereotypes with young with children, so trying to change the culture, the deep culture of society. But what would you say collective reparations would look like in your context? Thank you very much. Muchas gracias, comisionada. Eh, bueno, ahora yo también tenía algunos comentarios y preguntas. Primero, thank you, eh, commissioner. I have some questions and comments as well. First of all, I would like to thank you for your participation. The Inter-American Commission is preparing a convention on integral reparation, intertitional justice. So that's one of the goals of this hearing. Um, I have some comments, questions, and I'll try to summarize them. First of all, the participation of victims when determining the reparation measures. That participation needs to be differentiated in terms of women and also of LGBTI plus persons. I would like to know if you have experiences, the methodologies that you know and that have been used that allow for that differentiated participation. And the second aspect that I would like to mention is sexual violence. Um, usually sexual violence victims do not report sometimes and they do not participate in reparation processes because their name will become visible. So can, how can we guarantee the participation of sexual violence victims so that they do not feel re-victimized? Also, um, I'd like to mention a case that appeared with the Truth Commission in Peru and of Colombia, that is the situation of the children born out of sexual violence. Um, if they are the subjects of reparations or not, and how you can identify those cases. And with regard to this, we need to see the different types of reparation in order to guarantee integral or comprehensive reparation. And this goes beyond compensation. So, for example, which satisfaction measures could be guaranteed. For example, the uh, pardon requests, how these pardon requests should be made, because this goes beyond compensation, especially taking into consideration also that victims do not want to be visible. Their names, they don't want their names to appear. And also we have the Nina Tedoja case uh, that includes some important set reparation measures, but what other reparation measures you think that could be appropriate? Also Ingrid and others, we're mentioning the situation of sexual violence against Afro and indigenous women. So how can repair in these cases? taking into consideration the culture and the traditions of these communities. I'm also thinking about the children born out of sexual violence when the fathers do not belong to that community. Because sometimes it could be, uh, we need to think uh, about two types of reparation for the mothers and for their children. And I was thinking as about this new perspective on reparation. You have mentioned it. That is about a transforming approach. Oh, therefore, I would like for you to share any experiences that you have identified. Uh, you can mention this now, or you can send them in writing. Now I would like to focus on the specific case of Argentina and Uruguay, the South Cone, the sexual violence, cases occurred during the dictatorship. And then we talk about the violence after the dicta dictatorship, when the uh, crime or the statute of limitations has expired. 
and this also in the case of Colombia, for example, reproductive violence, because several truth commissions did not recognize this at the very beginning. And in those cases, how we can establish reparation measures for victims of reproductive violence and sexual violence, or for example, as Leonor was saying, the reparation measures for those women who belong to armed conflicts. They were perpetrators, but they were also victims of sexual violence in the interior of those groups. I have many questions. There is one more. Regarding differentiated reparation measures for LGBTI plus persons, how do we address the situation of trans persons? We have some progress in the American system, including the advisory opinion 29 and the case of Vicky Hernandez for the reparation of trans women. How we can promote reparation measures for trans men and taking into consideration the normative frameworks who have not been designed for this group of persons. Um, this is how I would like to conclude the participation of the Inter-American Commission. And now I would like to give the floor to civil society organizations. You have 28 minutes. I'd like to give the floor now to the state of Argentina um, who was spending and after that, we will continue with civil society organizations. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for allowing me to participate on behalf of the state of Argentina at this hearing. What we want is to advance in this matter uh, by following the recommendations of the Inter-American standards, call it up on states, to strengthen their policies, to modify those policies that are incorrect and to create new policies. I'd like to request permission to participate because I'm the only representative of the state that is participating at this hearing. And I'm sorry that this is the case because the states need to learn a lot about this matter. My contribution today is to share with you what's happening in Argentina right now. And um, to contribute, to the organizations in the region. In Argentina, we have a process that made us really proud. Uh, uh, we are really proud of that project. According to the Office of the Prosecutor of Crimes Against Humanity of the Public Prosecution Office, we have over 150 sentences that have also a sentence that includes gender-based violence crimes. So gender violence crimes are considered crimes against humanity in Argentina and that are related to torture. And this is an advance in our country. There is a very important resolution of the public prosecutor office in our country that allow for the investigation and judgment of these cases. And the prosecutor received guidelines to address sexual violence as a crime, a crime against humanity in our country. And this was possible thanks to the efforts made by the human rights movements in Argentina uh, who made sexual violence visible as a crime against humanity. And this helped develop some memory policies with a gender perspective. The president of the commission was able to visit the memory site of the former ESMA that includes an exhibition on women during the dictatorship. So many of the crimes of the dictatorship have been made visible with a gender perspective. However, uh, in the few minutes that I'm going to take of this here, and I would like to talk about something that is not so popular and that is happening in Argentina. We are including a diversity perspective in reparation measures. Argentina has several policies on reparation. There are laws that are 30 years old that guarantee reparation for victims of crimes against humanity and serious violations of human rights. Many of these laws were promoted by the Secretariat on Human Rights of the country, but also there are 
laws of reparation at the provincial level. And I would like to mention the different resolutions issued in recent year that recognize the trans victims of the dictatorship and as victims, they are recognized as victims of state terror. And we identified the illegal detention center and the 44 the 24 days of deprivation of liberty that she uh, faced were recognized and she has received a lifelong pension for that recently there was also progress in another resolution favoring karina pignanelli and in the case of karina uh, Karina was not detained in an illegal detention center. It's a different case from the one that I mentioned before about Valeria. Karina, um, Valeria was deprived in an illegal detention center, so that had to be recognized. In the case of Karina, she stayed in a police station, not an, at an illegal detention center. And many people, um, was detained in police stations. So that systematic detention suffered by Karina is recognized as the plan of the dictatorship. So also she received compensation and a, long, a lifelong pension. And the same is happening in the province of Buenos Aires, which has a legislation in which recognized so far two trans persons uh, because of the crime suffered during the dictatorship. And the same is happening in the province of Santa Fe. We have over 50 victims who are trans persons and who have received reparation measures um, thanks to the legislation of the province. This is something that started a few time ago, some time ago, but we are making progress also I would like to mention some initiatives by the civil society organizations. For example, in Rosario, we have the General Memory um, Archive. Um, and this is an initiative by civil society organizations aimed to recover the history and the memory of the LGBTI collective. And these initiatives help states and help at a regional level. And to conclude, I would like uh, to say that our secretariat and our technical team is here to collaborate with the commission and with other states. Thank you so much. Um, the civil society organizations can continue. You can take the floor. Can I begin? Thank you so much, Commissioner. I would like to answer some of your questions. The Centro de Derechos Reproductivos has some suggestions. We sent the Commission a report on gender violence during the Colombian and conflict, and we provide several recommendations. And I would like to mention some of those recommendations regarding the participation of the victims without re-victimization we suggest working with focus groups in order to strengthen community leadership when they exist. In Colombia, women are already organized and they have these trust spaces in their communities. And in these spaces, they can talk freely and they feel safe, say, feel safe to talk. And um, these could be promoted through focus groups so that women 
can't participate because they don't feel comfortable speaking to the authorities. In the case of children that are victims of sexual violence, in our report, we mentioned that reparations should not be only for the mothers, but also for the children. And we include some specific aspects such as training to break uh, poverty cycles and also some measures to promote the construction of positive identity because several children suffer a stigmatization in their communities because they are children born out of sexual violations and therefore we believe that those challenges should be addressed and it's not about just providing a monetary compensation for the victims there should be other measures so that these victims can resume their life projects and we can break the poverty cycle. Regarding guarantees, we believe that it's important to strengthen those policies that guarantee access to reproductive and sexual health and education, especially in urban and rural communities. Um, we believe that apart from non-repetition measures, sexual and reproductive health and education are key. Also, it's important to talk to the victims. There is not black and white answer when it comes to pardon requests. We know that they are a reparation measure, but sometimes it's important to consult with the communities to know what they think about these measures, such as pardon requests. Also, for us, it's important to make reproductive violence visible and it should be included as a category of violence in the legal frameworks of the states. In Colombia, it has been ordered to include reproductive violence as a type of violence. And I think this is a very important first step. And also women combatants should be considered victims when they have suffered reproductive violence in their groups, such as in the case of forced contraception or forced abortions suffered by these women who belong to the armed groups. Also, in Colombia, we have recognized cases of trans persons who have big victims of uh, forced pregnancies in Colombia. And we have been able to identify together with the Truth Commission the types of specific damage suffered by these victims because we know that there are additional elements that do not happen in the case of cisgender women. In addition, it's important to highlight in the case of Colombia, as a reparation measure, it's necessary to eliminate those state policies that cause damage to reproductive health. I'm talking about drug policies and glyphosate policies who have suffered, who have caused damage on the women in the areas of armed conflict. And the Truth Commission in Colombia recommended not to spray glyphosate over the communities because these cause damages to reproductive and sexual health and to health and ecosystems in Colombia. And therefore we need to stop those state policies. And that is part of the necessary reparation to guarantee the gender perspective in those reparation measures in, just, in, trans, in transitional justice. Thank you so much. Thank you, Madam President. I would like to mention some aspects regarding Chile. Uh, the issue of glyphosate and especially the effects on women is very important. Also, regarding children, as you were asking, Madam President, I would like to mention that in spite of all the years that Chile has been working on this, and we have classified 900 children in this situation, only 60 have received some kind of reparation or compensation. And sometimes uh, in Colombia, some of these children are being recruited again by armed groups. Um, regarding now the situation of Chile, it's important to supplement something that Magdalena said before. It's important to mention the transitional part of the hearing because this is a transitional process. I'd like to mention that in recent years, 
we have several resolutions that have highlighted the importance of guaranteeing the conventionality control. In Chile, there were administrative reparation for everyone, but now it's important to have a differentiated approach taking into consideration the specific aspect of each of the victims. And this is something relevant. We are using this now in many cases, such as the case that the commission mentioned in one of its readers, the Santiago Court of Appeals having double uh, the compensations considering sexual violence as a mode of torture against women and men. And I think that this aspect should be included in all reparations across the country. And it should go other measure apart from the monetary compensation. And regarding non-repetition measures, and taking into consideration the progress made in terms of sexual violence, in our country, there is a report by the Inter-American Commission that reads that there is only a condemning sentence. But I think that it's important to mention the issues that we have faced in some of our countries. For us, it's been very difficult to make some of these violations visible. Thank you so much. I would like to give the floor to my colleague, Magdalena. It's very important to highlight the women organizations have uh, fought for the policies in order to make visible sexual police violence in particular uh, women that are part of uh, leftist parties. These uh, practice should be made visible and we should have to implement different measures in order to protect the victims. It has been used as an excuse, the existence of rape and sexual violence in order to maintain the uh, reports by the commission's confidential for many years. The children that were born during captivity were incorporated and also children who were born as a result of rape. And also as non-repetition measures, it has been demanded by women's organizations for the establishment of the criminal type of sexual police violence uh, with a particular approach, incorporating this type of violence as something that is described as a criminal type of its own. We are looking for the establishment of our remedies, not only monetary reparation, in order to develop the necessary transitional justice reparations. Everything that has been said is very interesting. The proposal to be up to date regarding some of these concerns. In that regard, we would like to say that our, after we have filed our demand, it is not only this group of 28 women that fight the lawsuit. This is a commitment to all women who have suffered violence because they were prisoners and they are represented by those 28. The process why in 2011, when the impunity law was still present, we were able to file this lawsuit has to be explained. But actually what we always say, and I believe that Uruguayan women understand us, we are a symbol of everything that hasn't been said yet. Some of the elements related to non-repetition guarantees has to do with this way of working. And from the justice point of view, it is a barrier to us when violation 
uh, crimes are not considered crimes against humanity and they can say they have not existed as they are not part of the law that is being used regarding reparations women and all aspects related to their defense and the political recognition during the dictatorship. It has been very hard for them to work with the state, but as a symbolic reparation, we were able to have a place for women that is going to be open next year. And it is a symbolic space representing all women's women who suffer from persecution and who have been repressed. There are many things related to the future. I have taken down notes. And in that regard, we want to show that we are open-minded to work with all women, in particular with young women in the future. This short paragraph that we wanted to implement uh, programs to achieve equality in all sectors in connection with uh, reproductive education, health rights. This is going to help women who are now going through violence violent process, which we were not able to stop. Thank you. Regarding the collective reparation measures, there are some good examples in Colombia. Maybe those who work in that country can explain them, but also their experiences in Guatemala, that we should review. These are collective reparation experiences that are based on criminal sentences that is not very common in the region. These sentences, in particular in the Sepor Sarko case, but the genocide case as well, these were violations that occurred in community contexts uh, that affected indigenous populations and reparations should be aimed at transforming the reality of those communities and redignify direct victims within their communities. These are good examples that exist not within administrative programs of reparations, but uh, criminal sentences that we should review. As it has been said before, victims, uh, children should be considered as victims, children who were born in captivity and any other relatives that were affected directly. We need to go beyond the idea that the victim of gender based violence, sexual violence is just we, a woman or a man, but there can be victims within their circle. Regarding the importance of determining the names of the victims of sexual violence in re registers and uh, reparation programs that should be based on a dialogue with the victims. We should not believe that no victim wants to be recognized publicly as such. In other regions, there are experiences, examples of victims that are not identified by their name, but some kind of code, but this needs to be based on dialogue and the participation of the beneficiaries. Furthermore, 
in terms of non-repetition guarantees, it is very important for the Inter-American Commission in their its dialogue with the states makes emphasis on the fact that establishing not reparation not repetition measures within reparations should include an approach not only about the fulfillment of the measures but the benefit for the states and their populations for them to prevent that is to say not only to incorporate the recognition of what has happened but there was the future as well many victims are involved in justice trust trust uh, truth and memory programs also for uh, this not to be repeated in the future this was very explicit by women in guatemala and also accountability should go hand in hand with non-repetition guarantees this is something we should bear in mind reparations should be transformative but also we should be careful when using that term so that in the sphere of reparation we do not include transformations that could involve many public policies we cannot ask transitional justice reparations for uh, huge transformations because in the long term that is going to produce frustration among the victims so we should be careful regarding the language that we use and the uh, scope of reparations within the uh, transitional justice in a specific country regarding the question about collective reparation that commissioner roberta made it is important to point out that truth just uh, commissions in have identified collective victims be whether they belong to an ethnic identity or political ethnic uh, identity where attacks were aimed at eliminating those identities so that they disappear those attacks have not been made visible for the lgbti population because homosexuality was a crime so this way of legitimizing violence existed as and they were affecting the lgbti population regarding transformative reparations very important to use that terms when it comes to lgbti we cannot go to the previous uh, violent situation because in the case of the case of the lgbti population that was criminalization law was criminalizing and totalitarian uh, regimes used that as a way of legitimizing that uh, social cleansing that was not identified in many transitional justice process at the regional level that's why we need a transformative reparation in these transitional cases in particular regarding the criminalization of homosexuality in the countries of the region. I will now give the floor to Karen. Thank you, Christian. We would like to affirm that the policies were the result of different processes um, established by totalitarian governments, such as the criminalization of uh, homosexuality in order to carry out uh, this social cleansing. That's why the rights were not recognized. And there are new ways of criminalizations as we have seen in Peru eradicating uh, trans and transvestites that should be uh, eliminated by states in order to achieve transformative justice. In Paraguay, we can find a process of reparation. In 2013, LGBTI groups presented a bill that 
was aimed at recognizing a day as the day of the rights of LGBTI people so that the persecution of LGBTI persons could be um, reviewed and taught at school. Also, visibilizing other identities in the region is very important. They were not recognized as victims of the armed conflicts in the region, but they were very limited. It was not thought they could be vile, uh, victims of sexual and reproductive violence. In many cases, we did not have any information. International standards should bear this in mind. We want to congratulate the fact that the special rapporteur for memory, truth, and justice of the commission uh, should foster uh, the issue of a report, including all these different aspects. Thank you. I would like to thank the members of the commission for their comments and the colleagues of the different organizations for their participation. Our delegation would like to congratulate Mr. Carrera for the Commission of Truth in Colombia with the intersectional gender chapter, also in the chapter about ethnic and Afro peoples, the commission should foster the implementation of the recommendations made in such an institution. We would like to point out that in order to consolidate peace, we cannot be limited to the ceasefire process, but states should be concerned about overcoming the structural situations of inequality in the city, such as racism and discrimination of vulnerable groups. When we make reference to symbolic reparations regarding Afro-LGBTI people, we would like to point out that states should foster measures to recognize and include Afro-LGBTI persons within the society, recognizing the violence suffered by them as they did not comply with moral imperatives regarding their sexual orientation, gender identity. With the aim of changing social imagery regarding these uh, populations in Afro communities uh, outside of them, we would like to point out that it is important for states to include perspective and education regarding non binary and trans persons and taking into account legal framework that were not developed for them or did not uh, included them should be modified in order to include them. In the case of Colombia, the limitations that exist for the for changing the gender in their ID, that should be recognized by all institutions in the state in a coordinated way, as there should be unified databases so that victims can access this right and other measures of reparations. And these persons have the responsibility of presenting all proceedings before each institution in order to be recognized according to the gender they have chosen. It is very important to include the participation of Afro-trans non-binary persons in peace uh, processes. Thank you. Thank you. Soledad Garcia is here. And I will now give her the floor so she can make her comments. Thank you. Thank you, dear president. I'd like to greet the commissioners and everyone today. It's a pleasure to participate in this hearing. I just want to give share with you a short message. I know that we have a system that and which is very difficult to guarantee a gender perspective. Uh, I think that is fundamental. I think that it's very interesting, including reparation in terms of mental health and social protection. 
I think that I have a question, Madam President. I would like for the organizations to send us all the relevant information because there are best practices that we need to identify as well as everything that has to do with health, with education to promote memory, truth, and justice. Uh, for example, some countries have a day. Uh, Argentina has the March 24th, Chile now has a day as well, and also to have information on the role of culture to guarantee truth, memory, and justice. Thank you so much. Thank you, Soledad. We are close uh, getting to the end of this Madam hearing. President, and Madam President, could I please just make a less than a minute? Less than a minute, okay. <laughs> yes. I can't, I can't make any Wi-Fi calls on WhatsApp to you. So I'm sorry to intervene in this way. I just wanted to say that I, I think that uh, one area that I wanted to highlight if I had spoken earlier is that when we, when we monitor states uh, um, implementation of recommendations and directives from the court on issues of reparation, I, we, especially when it has uh, uh, the, if we ask for particular groups to be trained, the state reports in our monitoring, yes, we have established training and we do this and we do that and so on. But in fact, we do not know whether that training is ongoing, continuing training, or as most states do, a once in time only training, which is ineffective. And secondly, there is also the, the situation of states' obligation to transform the thinking of the populace, the whole populace, especially when it relates to discrimination against vulnerable groups, which is generally a societal problem. And we, we, I don't think that we effectively monitor that aspect. Of, of the state's implementation and, and uh, um, meeting the reparatory requests of the commission or of directives of the court. And I was thinking that we ought to try and do that more openly and, and forcefully. Uh, if I, I got through what I wanted to say clearly, and I thank you all, and I do apologize for being late this morning. No, no, no te Don't worry, dear Margaret. We have nine minutes that were left and we have allocated them very effectively now. So I, I was saying we are reaching the end of this meeting. I would like to thank each of the representatives of civil society that are here and the representative of the state of Argentina, Andrea Pochak. Thank you for being here because it's also important to know that policies that are being developed by the state. I just want to make some concluding comments. First, we would thank you for any information that you have presented, if you could send that information in writing to the commission. Secondly, I would like to uh, repeat the request made by Karina regarding a report on LGBTI persons and traditional justice. The commission is preparing its plan for 2023 and we could include that report for next year. Um, I also want to thank you a lot. Many of us know each other because of all the work that you do. And I thank you for the work that you do every day. The commission decided to have this to hold this ex officio meeting or hearing because it's important to make your work visible and to show the challenges to have reparation with a gender perspective because this is something that has not been included in the development of transitional justice so far. Um, we see, we understand that there is a lot that is being going on in the truth commissions in Colombia, in Peru, in other countries. And this is a result of the efforts made by several women victims. I would like to thank you, all of you, and I would like to thank Antonia Janias for participating at this hearing. The commission wants to especially thank you 
and all the women who have been denouncing this situation and who have been working so much for a long time. Now we have more standards, but these standards have been built for many years. And in the past, we didn't have information or the standards. Uh, for example, this is also the case for the criminalization of LGBTI persons. And when they are criminalized, victims don't want to speak. Dear Victoria, we would like to know when the um, memory space will be open in Uruguay. I hope that I can be there for the opening. I would like to thank you again for all your work, for all the information that you have shared with us. And this hearing will be, is being broadcasted. And I know that many victims from the LGBTI community, many victims of sexual violence, or many children who have suffered stigmatization because of sexual violence, we hope that they receive from the Inter-American Commission our respect, our thanks, and our commitment to continue making their situation visible because we want to continue working and to promote this important gender perspective in transitional justice and especially in reparation measures. I would like to adjourn this hearing and have a good day. Thank you so much. Muchas gracias, un gusto. Gracias, Dios. Adiós, gracias. Un placer, un placer. Gracias. Buen día.